Thank you, Kasmin, for the introduction. Thank you, Freya and Parasite, for having me here. And I'm very honored to be among uh, all these great speakers and curators and writers and intellectuals today. Um, perhaps I want to start with just a little bit of my struggle with the title of this section. Um, perhaps I'm not very good respondent or following themes and instructions of this section as I feel like the subject matter is more or less the most ambiguous one among all the other topics. That's just my own feelings, you can disagree. If we start by analyzing the term, the economy of artistic production, we will find ourselves submerged in a labyrinth of possible implications. In the general art context, production means artistic creativity, imagination, or inventiveness as it comes through artistic labor to modify what exists in the world. But I believe the subject line, exhibition as part of the economy of artistic production, cannot be simply interpreted as artists use exhibition format as a form or medium for artistic expression, which can sometimes refer to the popular discussions around artist as curator or curator as artist. But still, I'm a little confused towards the phrase economy here. Does it carry specific complicated meanings in this context? Does it refer to certain modes of art economy system today that we find ourselves trapped in, such as the cycle of producing, exhibiting, distributing, selling, and co collecting? Or does the economy refer to a way of careful and efficient use and management of available resources according to the dictionary? How can exhibition making efficiently manage the resources of art and art products? These confusions on some level extended to the fundamental yet unarticulated logics of art making and exhibition making in today's global condition. I'm afraid I won't be able to provide direct answers to these questions in my presentation today. But I do hope these questions can perhaps serve as an interesting background of today's conversation. For my presentation, I will simply eliminate the confusing part of my own and to focus on artistic production and its relationship with exhibition making. Based on my own interests and a set of parameters I set for myself, which can be perhaps summarized in the following aspect. The content is relatively historical rather than contemporary. Understanding artistic production with the actual involvement of art labor. Understanding the production of space, especially the production of social space as an essential and important practice of exhibition making. And how such notion of space production interact with art produ production. How can historical artworks be relevant both at the time and today while challenging and enriching the discourses around exhibition making? These parameters point to me um, to the land art movement in the 1960s and 70s. I'm no expert of land art history, nor do I think that there are no other examples fit into the structures of the, these parameters. I'm also not going to based my presentation on these parameters, but they simply lead me to think about some of um, the case studies of land art at the time. So I will be focusing on that. And this image is probably the most iconic or cliched work of land art, assuming that you have not physically been to any of these sites. It is very common to associate land art to remote sites far from urban environment and romanticized, ima romanticized imagination of American Southwest desert. These are all true in describing some characteristics of land art. Moreover, the assumption would be that one has to be physically in these landscapes before she or he can, serve, uh, can even start to understand it. However, land art actually had a rigorous exhibiting history at the time. 
without which it would not have been the part of art history that we read or understand. Again, I'm not going to make any judgment or intellectual evaluation of these exhibitions. I simply wanted to walk through um, everybody here with some of the historical examples on the gallery shows of land art, as well as um, some more recent examples that I found relevant. Some of the early exhibitions were organized by gallerists and patron Virginia Dawn, first at her Los Angeles gallery, then in New York, such as the 1968 Earthwork show, which uh, you see an installation shot here. In 1969, there was also the seminal Earth Art Exhibition organized by Willoughby Sharp and took place at the Andrew Dixon White Museum of Art on the campus of Canal University in New York State. Other examples include ecological art at John Gibson Gallery in New York, also in 1969, place and process at Edmonton Art Gallery in Alberta, Canada, also in 1969. Internationally, there was the 1970 exhibition Conceptual Art, Art Prova, Land Art at the Galleria Civica de Art Moderna in Torino and was organized by Germano, Galant, and among others. It is not difficult to identify quite a few key artists whose names repetitively appeared in the brochures and flyers of these above-mentioned exhibitions, such as Walter de Maria, Michael Heiser, Dennis Obenham, Robert Smithen, among others. In addition to participating gallery shows, these artists were also making monumental, walks, uh, monumental works on the site. De Maria did his mile-long drawing in 1968, an ephemeral work for which the artist traces two parallel charcoal lines along a mile-long stretch of California's Mojave Desert. Between 1969 and 1970, Heiser created Double Negative, which consists of two trenches cut into the eastern edge of the Mormon Mesa, northwest of Everton, Nevada. Smithen, Smithen completed Sparrow Jetty, which you saw earlier, in 1970, an installation in Rosal Point, Box Elder County, Utah. The intention in connecting these site-specific earthworks at their gallery and their gallery representations perhaps is best manifested in Dennis Openham's Gallery Transparent series in 1969. These are two images of a series of work he did. The intention, um, Oppenheim redrew the floor plan of the gallery, materialized by a shape on the snow-covered ground, respectively on the campus of Cornell University in Kearney, New Jersey, and on a pond side in a bird secretary. In the gallery space, each location is designated by a photograph and a map. Topography of the gallery, once transposed in a different non-artistic space, revealed its absurdity and undefinable and uncanny nature. In some cases, such as on the site of the bird sanctuary, the flattered gallery space was then randomly activated by flocks of bird, alighting on it in different compositions that were unaffected by the artist's intention. And of course, there is the famous site non site series by Robert Smithen, as he expla explained the logic behind it. The non site, which refers to an indoor art earthwork, is a three dimensional logical picture that is abstract, yet it represents an actual site. It is by this dimensional metaphor that one site can represent another site which does not resemble it. This is the non site. Figures such as Virginia Dawn not only hosted gallery exhibitions, but also provided crucial financial funds to the realization of these earthworks. It is clear that the works on the field and the gallery exhibitions closely influenced each other and even made each other possible. In a recent essay published on Art Forum, Dawn recalls, quote, Smith and Nancy Holt and I began to look at sites around New York and New Jersey 
and further south into Virginia, we ended up taking a number of trips together in search for land on which to make works. In 1968, when we could not find land that was available, we were inspired to organize the Earthwork show in the gallery. Earthworks ended up featuring 10 artists, including Carl Andrew, Herb Bayer, Walter de Mario, Michael Heiser, Stephen, Stephen Kartenbach, Solowitz, Robert Morris, Carl Odenberg, Dennis Obenham, and Smithen. While on the other hand, an exhibition took place in the gallery from March to April of 1969 that featured Water, Water de Mario's installation work, Bed of Spikes, composed of five, five steel, steel panels on the ground with different numbers of spikes projecting from them was essentially the beginning for the artist's thinking of lightning field, according to Dawn in the same article. She continues, later in 1974, Water installed the first lightning field on the property of Burton and Emily to remain near Flagstaff, Arizona. It was made of 35 stainless steel poles, but when we weren't able to sell it, I ended up with these gorgeous 20-foot stainless steel poles in my storage space. Eventually, I gave them to the DIA Foundation. It is worth noting that many of the artworks featured in these early exhibitions, despite of their gallery presentations, were very much commission and action-based, carried a strong sense of performativity, and were ephemeral in nature. Willoughby Sharp, who curated the Earth Art Show for the Andrew Dixon White Museum of Art at Cornell University, invited artists who he trusts to deliver work and to do that at the museum on site. And he considered this was the most important thing about the Earth Art Show. The only requirement was that, quote, each artist had to touch dirt, end of quote. He recalled that the night the show opened, there was kind of blizzard. The Maria flew in and during the opening, and there were hundreds of people going through the museum. He had the cartons of earth emptied into the center of the floor, and then he got his only tool, which was a push broom, with bristles and a long handle, and he pushed the earth into a carpet, and then was about two inches high. And when that was done, to his satisfaction, he did it very meticulously. He took the broom and turned it so that the end of the broom handle became a marker, and very slowly across the tablet of earth, he wrote, good, and then fuck. As soon as Tom Levitt, the museum's director, saw that and realized that there were kids at the opening as well as the president of the university, they conned on off the room, put off the sheetrock, and then next day, the piece was swept up and dispersed. There are only one or two rare photographs of the piece, and consequently, the Maria was no longer in the show. In addition, Sharp had personally knew, exhibited, wrote about, and interviewed many of the artists on this international list that he prepared for Earth Art Exhibition since 1964. He later launched the first edition of Everlaunch magazine to feature these conversations and thoughts behind the actual making of the works, and the magazine also served as the catalog of the show. Sharp considered this first issue, quote, a publication, a catalog, a curatorial effort that replicated a show without an exhibition. Everlaunch was the exhibition itself, end quote. In many ways, these characteristics of the exhibition can be compared to Hara Zeman's When Attitudes Becomes Form, which is much more populated and well-known. And the show just opened actually a few days after in the same year. In many ways, Sharp's show is less an ex exhibition of earth art in the art historical sense, but a show of art about earth as Sharp also at the same time planned air, fire, and water in his series of exhibitions that devoted to the four nature elements. 
it is a curatorial experiment that intends to challenge and push the boundaries of the institutional framework at the time. So let's fast forward a few decades to 2012, when the exhibition Ends of the Earth, Land Art to 1974, took place first at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, and then at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, co-curated by Philipp Kaiser, and then the then senior curator of LA MOCA, and Mi Wang Kwan, an art, his, an art historian and professor at UCLA, who has one of the most important publications on land art and site-specific art published under her belt, one place after another, site-specific art and locational identity. The exhibition claimed it to be the most comprehensive survey of land art to date by featuring more than 100 artists, over 250 works, and numerous documents, archives, and ephemeral materials. In Kaiser and Kwan's introduction essay of the exhibition catalog, the, the two curators expressed their concerns on the legitimacy in presenting a museum exhibition on land art. They questioned, can anything presented in an exhibition setting come close to conveying the experience of walking into, for instance, Michael Heiser's double negative, a massive 50 by 30 by 1500 feet, which is about 15 by nine by 457 meters trench cut into the drying terrain of the Momo Mesa in Nevada? The answer is probably no, I'm afraid. If one is keen on seeking a kind of visceral experience which can only be acquired by going to the actual site, such instinct seems to echo with a couple of significant figures of the movement as both Michael Heiser and Walter de Mario declined the participation of this exhibition. De Mario actually deceased a year after the opening of the show. Their concerns were similar as Dawn tries to account for the Lucani in her essay, they prefer not to show the artifacts, documentations in a gallery, as they believe that only the first-hand experience can convey their sight, structure, and challenge in nature. Long walks along and through their forms, they feel are the only ways of appreciating their significance. The photograph is not the work. Despite of many reconstruction and reproduction of the historical work, the exhibition's real influence and ambition lie elsewhere. It is instead the acknowledgement of its historicizing nature with why it lends itself to be a kind of epistemological inquiry that returns to both artistic and curatorial activities of the 1960s and 70s make the show meaningful. Echoing with the title, the exhibition itself is a double entendre, its historicization embodied through its comprehensive survey format, signaling the end of land art as a movement, but at the same time, its inquiry opens up a new terrain by presenting four major propos propositions that counter the most common myths associated with land art. This is perhaps the real point of the show. This is just some of the installation shots of the exhibition. The show considers land art as an international phenomenon that is not exclusive to America by including works from Europe, Latin America, and Asia. It asserts land art is not an escape from the city. It, it is commonly characterized but is part of the complex process of urban transformation and special, spatial politics. Land art is highly entangled in the art system. Therefore, it is not accurate to consider it as a dematerialized and anti-object practice. In fact, it is closely tied to the developments in the art market, the art museum, and the mass media at once. Last but not least, Land art is a media practice as much as a sculptural one because the media, as in the other arena of the art system, contributed much to the production and legitimation of the land art discourse. 
In our order to achieve these ambitions, the exhibition's curatorial approach heavily relies on inclusion, display, and rearrangement of the documentation and reproduction of artworks. In addition to the actual work, the exhibition also partially reconstructed above-mentioned um, Povado Gallery exhibitions that I talked earlier, Earthworks at Virginia Down Gallery and Earth Art at Cornell University Museum to allow them become shows within the show. There is no doubt that Ends of Earth is a rigorous scholarship-driven exhibition but at the same time, it provides a platform and condition for exhibition making to be a kind of post-production. Perhaps we could introduce a possible notion here as curatorial post-production in relation to artistic production. It is, it is not uncommon to see such trend in many recent exhibitions. These exhibitions are often research-based, and some consider them as essay exhibitions. They often provide multiple points of views, sometimes contradictory points of views, and multiple layers of narratives. I, con I consider this kind of exhibition making in creating narratives among historical materials, ephemerals, archive artworks that requires reproduction, reconstruction, and other forms of, of representation other than the actual artwork, a kind of post-production effort. The process of post-production is like editing, both in terms of filmmaking and um, book editing, but sometimes the museum can turn out to be a documentary and maybe sometimes a fiction. Land art, its surrounding discourses, the practice and thinking of the artists involved in the movement continued in various ways to spread influences. It is not surprising to see how these practice and discourse continue to provide inspirations to the diverse range of contemporary art practice and curatorial practice that, dealt, that deal with land, earth, places, space, and territory. In his review of the Ends of Earth exhibition, Chris Wiley notes, quote, the artist in Ends of Earth th sought to enchant and examine the world itself, not only in a way that addressed its still urgently relevant political and ecological valences, but also the unfathomable eons of prehistory pre and geological time recorded in and on it and the awe-inspiring mystery of the cosmos that surrounds us. Following the above-mentioned logic of exhibition making as post-production and editorial process, fragments of land art practice are woven into the narratives of many recent exhibitions precisely because of its political and ec ecological concerns that are easily picked up to illustrate many trendy discussions around topics such as the Anthropocene, the, fic uh, the fiction and atrocity of modernity, and the object-oriented ontology, etc. Among them, the most quoted is, of course, Robert Smithson in his unexpectedly short life, who died in 1973. Smithson produced a large amount of works and writings. His key ideas, such as entropy, Entropy, evolution, repetition, and non-color continue to have their own life in creating new mythologies and narratives. It is not a coincidence that Smithen thinks, Smithen's thinking has been resurfacing as his doubts and skepticism on the meaning of progression and modernization have reflected the dystopia status quo of our current global condition. I would like to briefly reference two exhibitions of which I personally think Smithen and other land art thinking have played an essential, if not very visible, role in the making of exhibition. The first is Manifest 9, the deep of the modern, as its title, took place in the coal mining complex in Genk, Belgium, curated by Gottmolk Medina, Katrina Grogus, and Don Ace. The exhibition took a very literal approach 
to look at the history of coal mining as an approach to modernity and its current global implication in response to the exhibition site. The inclusion of Smithson's non-site, site on Sinton from 1968, which unfortunately I couldn't find an image, has to do with its history and a background story of Smithson's interaction with a series of American companies that were active in the exploitation and reclamation of open air mines. Smithson once approached the Hannah Cole Company about creating the earthwork Lake Edge Crescents in Egypt Valley, Ohio. He saw his art not only as a substitute for reclamation, but also as a kind of hinge or focal point in the dialectic of destruction and reclamation. More importantly, his site non-site series often are hybrids of comprised uh, are hybrids comprised of minerals, metal containers, photographs, maps, and other documents. They encompass both the geographical sources of his natural materials, the site, and their packaged relocation in the museum or gallery, the non-site, where they become legible as sculpture. Such confrontations dismantle Western modernity's linear and idealistic concept of progress. Robert Smithson's work was presented in the show in a historical section curated by Don Aids, where social realism paintings, maybe you can see a little bit here, and Duchamp's The Age of Coal were juxtaposed together. Smithson's work instead was, uh, was placed alongside a large-scale oil painting of a prehistorical scenery with an ambience cre created by the curator to represent a natural history museum. It is clear that the curator intends to drag the viewer back from the symbolic and metaphorical understanding of the assigned meanings and to return coal to its status as a natural substance. But such presentation obscured understanding of Smithen by flattening his work onto a mere materialistic level. The emphasis seems to lay on the work's mysterious and obscure presence, and for exhibition visitors who are unfamiliar with Smithen's work may misconstrue this installation as another display case of coal samples. These are not the actual work in the show, as I said, I couldn't really find an installation shop. I, ha I had a catalog of the exhibition, but I wasn't able to get access of it. These are just various, various um, examples of site and on site work that Smithen did. The second example is the 2013 exhibition, The Whole Earth, California, and the Disappearance of the Outside curated by Diederik Diederikson, who is actually our keynote speaker here for the conference, um, as well as Anselm Frank. Under the overall thematic approach of the Haus de Couture de Vet that year of the Anthropocene, the ambitious exhibition using California and American West Coast as focus to tell the story of the slipped from and slippage between the countercultural community, um, echo psychedelia and cybernetics of 1960s to the networked neoliberalism of today. Robert Smithen and the land art movement made into the narrative through a short film with his with Smithen's wife, Nancy Holt, entitled East Coast, West Coast, and was produced in 1969, in which they performed an argument over the cliched roles of Californian and New York artists of the 1960s to absurd and hysteria effect. It is an interesting curatorial choice, as again, such narrative played on the production of the relevant local mythologies of land art and artists' Californian hippie dream. Smithen was indeed closely associated with the cover motif of the Whole Earth Catalog, one of the Bibles of the ecological movement and also the thesis of the exhibition. The photographic image of the Earth was intended with ever-changing views to galvanize a generation of environmentally conscious civilization critics 
for smithing, however, this icon iconized of Mother Earth was already suspect because it, because it, in contrast to his anti-essentialist conception of nature as a geological, technological process of decay, is committed to a pastoral and times religious idea of nature as a peaceful entity worth of preservation. The same can be said about desert. As, oh, here are some exhibition views. And this is a, 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 a still image of, of the video. The same can be said about the desert as it is often imagined as a peaceful and hygienic reservation from the urban and industrial, far from the urban and the industrial, a place to avoid pollution or contention from other people. But this is merely an illusion or an American dream that one stubbornly wants to preserve as since the train companies, dam projects, industrial farms, and of course, military compounds all started to occupy the American West, the desert was no longer a hygienic preserve, an antidote to modernity, but instead a kind of back lot, storage area, and staging ground for cities, as art historian Julian Myers would argue. It is worth noting, now I'm gonna drift it away a little bit from just the exhibition making as to conclude my presentation. It is worth noting that land art can never be separated from its social conditions at the time. I actually would love to spend some time, uh, maybe during the discussion, to talk about um, the social, the production of social space and also the relationship with the urban ground of the whole land art movement. Um, but here, maybe I'll just conclude since time is up. Um, Although these recent exhibitions carry complete different premise, I found it fascinating in considering how the discourse and practice of land art continue to create tension and dynamics among different curatorial positions. The myths are challenged, evolved, and reconstructed again and again. One thing is certain though, such curatorial constructions are as complex as the positions of the artists at time when they produced these works. They actually navigated between a persistent dream of the desert's autonomy and a clear view of its appropriation into a global system. As Friedrich Jemison described it, this was, quote, a process in which the last surviving internal and external zones of pre-capitalism, the last vestige of non-commodified or traditional space within and outside of the advanced world, and now ultimately penetrated and colonized. In their turn, this comment perhaps is also relevant when considering the gentrification process associated with art and art production. Nevertheless, it is exhibition making that gives land art and earthwork its social life and therefore continued to allow artists and curators to ponder upon the different narratives associated with and beyond action at the time. Thank you. <laughs>